Okay, bon dia, good morning. <laughs> um, hope you had a good rest after the long presentation yesterday evening. I just would like, before I start, to see, do you remember anything from yesterday? <laughs> can, you, can someone tell me what uh, are you guys considering, besides what I was talking about yesterday, as the main challenges that the globally changing conditions are imposing on water resources management? Yesterday we focused on the climate change and what the climate change is. Just give me your thoughts or your understanding of this kind of changing world. Give, uh, you, well, I think that the challenge is that the system is becoming more complex. And I remember also that we need to go through resilient comes to the risks to more resilient cities okay. and systems. And uh, that I remember is that, that the complexity and... Uncertainty. Know. Complexity yeah, and uncertainty, uncertainty are the yeah, are really consequences. But I would like, I would like, can you tell me just physically what, you know, the water resources challenges are? These are kind of general, I think, characteristics of the future systems. Uh, but these systems subject to, let's say, increase in temperature, more frequent extremes and so on, are uh, really changing the landscape of the, you know, kind of water resources management field. What do you, what do you see as a challenge directly in the field, in the water resources management? What are the type of problems that Brazil is facing? What are the type of problems that other countries may be facing? Hydrological extremes like floods, they are getting more intense. The effects of droughts in places where we will not use it to have them. Things Dra like this. Droughts, are droughts mentioned yeah. also as a pretty significant, yeah. Um, uh, the, the water supply and the safety of water supply, yeah. So you see that these kind of changing conditions are really entering in almost every type of, uh, every type of activity that uh, uh, we are supposed to talk about. So today we are going to continue. I'm going to repeat some of the maybe basic uh, concepts I touched yesterday, and I'll go a little bit more. Today is going to be a little bit more analytical, a little bit more <laughs> math, but uh, I think this is the way to kind of fully understand how this idea of resilience can be introduced um, in a quantitative form. So I'm going to talk about <laughs> infrastructure systems. I'm going to talk about uh, this move from risk to resilience, and then we'll be focusing on use of resilience in addressing the, addressing the interconnected infrastructure problems. <coughs> Again, just the kind of beginning and the key messages for today. Uh, resilience is mentioned so many, many times, and I think in many fields you are going to see today a number of different definitions in many fields, uh, this term is becoming very popular and, you know, like it's good to mention resilience in every other sentence you're using, but I think there is something really essentially different from what we were doing in the past if we take this part of resilience and use that as really development paradigm, uh, use that as a fact to understand the future is going to be uh, and the future is going to be uncertain. The future will require to deal with the much more difficult problems, with much more complex problems. The future will not eliminate all the possible, or we don't have ability to eliminate all the possible, all the possible risks that will exist. And in that kind of context, risk is becoming insufficient measure and therefore, I think resilience is a good, um, good replacement and possibly uh, a treatment of the development in a form of the in a resilient form becomes something essential. So it's been kind of noticed that there is a practical link between the adaptation to changing conditions and the sustainable development. If you are able to adapt, if you are able to come up with the solutions which are going to be um, less sensitive to the changing conditions, I think these type of solutions will be much easier to sustain uh, in the future. And that's the idea of the 
kind of using resilience as a development paradigm. Um, I cannot stress enough that, you know, really systems approach is becoming essential to deal with the complexity, to deal with the uh, risk and resilience, especially in quantitative form. You need, you need an approach, and I think systems approach is uh, appropriate. Uh, it, it, it provides the ways to quantify the resilience, and also it provides the way to help us uh, help us uh, 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 define the problems and use the existing tools from the toolbox of the systems tools to solve these problems. Uh, it is important that we are talking about global change, we are talking about climate change, and these processes are all kind of happening on a very large scale. But local context and local conditions are determining, you know, how we adapt to these changing conditions. So understanding the context of the local of the local conditions, vulnerability, exposure, and so on, is essential in order to kind of uh, um, increase the resilience of the community and the resilience of individuals, communities, and the society as a whole. So resilience is a development paradigm, use of systems approach to quantify, and understanding of the local conditions, three key messages for, for today. Uh, this is what we reviewed yesterday, and you remember I was saying these consequences of the global change are complexity and uncertainty. Uh, that we also mentioned the impact on the infrastructure are essential, and when you are talking about that, don't forget that there is a hard infrastructure that usually engineers are dealing with, but also the changes that are occurring in the soft infrastructure are uh, as affecting what is happening in the, in the hard infrastructure. If the society or the institutions do not exist to um, develop measures and implement measures for adaptation, uh, many of the problems that exist in the domain of the hard infrastructure will remain unsolved. And that's where the link exists between the hard and, uh, hard and soft uh, infrastructure. Uh, I am just kind of showing you, this is the map of Canada, and uh, Canada is a very large country. This is the border with the U.S., and the U.S. is here, and you can see the kind of variety of uh, uh, conditions that exist. You have three uh, coastal areas, northern, east, and west coast. You have a, 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 the region of the Great Lakes with the very specific problems, conditions, and we have a prairies um, in the middle of the country, uh, Manitoba, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, parts of Alberta, and then a huge mountainous regions so of the Rocky Mountains between on the border between the uh, between Alberta and British Columbia. Um, uh, these, uh, uh, I'm unfortunately, they're not very clear, but this is the kind of historical map that shows the natural disasters that are hitting the country. And, and you can see <laughs> how many of them, and they're of all natures, from you know, earthquakes to windstorms to floods um, to droughts in green here. And uh, they've, been, they've been definitely increasing in intensity, increasing in frequency, and starting to be uh, pretty, pretty important for the kind of economy of the country. The um, country is very well developed and has only 38 million people as a population, but still <laughs> these natural disasters are creating conditions and requiring, uh, requiring uh, adaptation, adaptation that will be different from the current, uh, current practices. So exposure, these are the, this is the illustration of the kind of local uh, conditions. You see how different regions, uh, Great Lakes for example, compare to the west coast where the earthquakes are posing, you know, the very serious, uh, very serious threats uh, and combination of, you know, wind floods and others in this region are determining these local conditions that need to be fully understand in order to, in order to apply the concepts I'm talking about. Infrastructure is subject to uh, this kind of conditions. Um, these are the pictures of the real disasters in Canada. We had a very large ice storm 
that was one of the costliest disasters in the last uh, couple of decades, where simply during the period of kind of late winter and early spring, uh, uh, the conditions uh, create huge ice load on the infrastructure and affect everything. The whole city of Montreal was basically paralyzed for days by ice. The electricity was not available, and that was a winter time where the heating and everything else is. Uh, uh, the hospitals were, not, you know, affected and functioning. The roads were not passable because of the sheet of ice, and vehicles were not able to kind of move through and so on. Um, the second is that, that uh, these two pictures are from the last year. Huge, huge fires in the Fort McMurray area, the central part of Canada. Uh, very dry conditions uh, uh, created uh, created the wildfires, which are very common in in Canada during the summer, but this one basically destroyed the whole uh, community. This was one of the costliest, after the ice storm became one of the costliest disasters. So you see from ice to fire, I was telling you, this is the picture yesterday, I did show the same picture from Toronto to our rainfall uh, and the huge damage done to the infrastructure in the one of the largest cities. These are the other uh, pictures related to the same events. This is the main highway that goes from the uh, Toronto and you see people getting completely stuck. The rain came down in such a short period of time and with such a level of intensity that you were not able to escape. Uh, and, and the pictures like this were <laughs> taken, you know, to illustrate how the people were dealing with. These are, the, these are the light trains that are used for the communication with the surrounding communities. The train was completely stuck in the, in the water with the hundreds of people on the train uh, without ability, basically, to uh, evacuate and move. So, two hours rainfall event, you know, with the consequences, and I mentioned the cost of over $1.5 billion when you add together impacts on infrastructure and what was happening, you know, to the people and interruption in the transport and so on. So, so infrastructure and hazards in this kind of disasters are very, very interconnected. And, and I think this is where the, our work and our discipline comes into the picture. Engineers are heavily involved, I think, in finding the solutions for uh, this type of these type of problems. This is one of the kind of generic uh, um, ideas of infrastructure and uh, basically pointing out the, the dependency that exists between different types of infrastructure. If you look at the kind of the circles that represent the transportation, gas or energy supply, uh, telecommunications, water, electricity supply, oil, and all these kind of key uh, uh, elements, elements of infrastructure kind of intersect with each other. Uh, uh, you had the uh, communications affecting, you know, the electrical supply and water supply and transportation. You have a transportation directly affecting, you know, the, the transport of energy. Again, it's, uh, you have a water affecting uh, uh, the other things. So, so there is a, a, a very tight interconnection and dependence between different type of infrastructure. That uh, leads to so-called the cascading failures. Um, that the, if one of these components uh, uh, fails, the, the problem and the failure propagates through the system and starts affecting the other, other components. And that's one of the, I think, key requirements for considering the, considering the uh, um, solutions for interconnected infrastructure. Understanding that uh, the components are connected and that the connection between the components actually propagates the failure throughout the system and therefore we need a specific approach that will be able to, uh, to address this. Uh, interconnections. Kind of finding the effective measure to protect and prevent this uh, uh, propagation is relatively hard and very costly. All these different types of infrastructure are 
you know, costly by itself, but the fact that, you know, failure of the communication may be affecting, you know, transportation is adding to the cost, and it's not only the cost that will be bared by the, you know, telecommunication and transportation sectors, but additional cost on both sectors that exist due to the fact that interdependence is, a fact, you know, very important. Um, it is the fact that infrastructure resilience is often overestimated and the overestimation comes from the fact that we quite often ignore some of these connections uh, or we are not fully aware uh, how the connections may be transferring the failure from one uh, part of the system into another part of the system. Yesterday I was referring in my presentation to feedbacks, the feedbacks between different components of the systems, which are theoretical concepts in systems analysis. And in, if you are looking infrastructure, <laughs> that's become you know, even the physical, uh, physical reality. But traditional approach being kind of used to deal with this is, you know, based on the probability of the failure and uh, uh, using risk-based approach. And that's what, you know, we are going to kind of see today or how this is this sufficient and how we can move from that to something that I feel is a little bit more appropriate for the future to idea of resilience. I'm going to show you four pictures from, oh my God, this is not very effective. <laughs> uh, I'm going to show you four pictures from last week, disaster on Bahamas. Uh, this disaster, I hope you heard over, you know, in the news was caused by the Hurricane Dorian, which basically leveled uh, number of islands and pay very serious attention to each of them. There is something common in the pictures and that's what I would like you to identify. <coughs> you know that Dorian brought huge, huge winds over 200 kilometers per hour and it was huge storm that was moving very slowly over the island and that slow movement actually kept these winds and rain, uh, uh, you know, hitting the, hitting the land for a long period of time. That's one picture. This is another picture. You see the kind of disaster and pay attention to details. That's a third picture. and the fourth picture. Okay, now tell me what did you see as a possi possible kind of common theme in all these four pictures? Did you notice anything common? What did you notice? No? Look again. Destruction. <laughs> Destruction, okay, yes. But something in all these four pictures was kind of successfully standing in all these destructive conditions. You see the palm tree in the middle. Look at the palm trees in the back. Look at the palm tree on the left. Look at the palm tree here. So you see all the structures, the buildings, the roads, the roofs flying, but these palm trees kind of survived. And the kind of logical question is, you know, why, why they don't fall down in the disaster? Anyone knows possibly the answer to this question? They're very specific trees. Uh, they have, a, they have a leaves that are very long, sharp, and in the wind, they can adjust the direction and basically resist the wind force very effectively. The second characteristic is that the trunk of the palm tree is very different from any other trees. Uh, normal trees grow in circles, 
And the circles, you know, the yearly annual circles are basically like a cylinders, empty cylinders, and just one on top of another creates the trunk of the tree. In the case of palm trees, the structure of the trunk is completely different. It's like a set of uh, uh, segments that are connected together one on top of another. And the third characteristic of these trees is that their roots are very shallow, but spread very fast. So you see how basically the nature created the tree, uh, which is very well suited to these extreme conditions and resists the winds, the storms and disasters much better than the structures that we are, we are designing. And that was, that, that, that these four pictures and this type of uh, kind of natural adjustment and adaptation is something that at least motivated my work in the field of uh, resilience. This is what I would call the palm tree is a perfect example of the resilient system. And the system that's, you know, really designed by nature over the long period of time to survive, to survive the loads and uh, extreme, extreme conditions very effectively. So, uh, I, if you look at the area of disaster management, we uh, have to kind of uh, agree that there is a shift in approaching the disaster management uh, from kind of focusing on the risk or reducing the risk to the idea of actually creating from our structure something like a palm trees, basically building disaster resilience through different adaptation uh, options. Um, from kind of considering the static response and vulnerability to finding dynamic attributes of the, of the system and understanding you know, how in the different points of time. Dynamic means understanding the whole process of the response of the system to changing conditions over time and finding actually where the appropriate adaptation measures should and could be uh, applied. And obviously, uh, in order to effectively kind of move from this static to dynamic conditions and basically move from risk to resilience, we need to look at the and understand the importance of the spatial and temporal dynamics. So how the conditions are changing in space and, um, and time. This is what I think you're probably used to and very often in engineering we are using this kind of broad definition of risk as a pro you know, product of the hazard or the probability of the hazard and consequences and the consequences can include you know, the exposure and vulnerabilities and you can kind of create the relationships based on a type of problem that you have that you know, can resemble something like this where we have a probability of hazard and on the right, you know, and multiply that with the, with the consequences in the form of, you know, various uh, components of the system uh, uh, damage, being damaged and some interruptions in the functioning and then adding these together uh, uh, to represent the consequences so that we can find the risk. And I was telling yesterday the product of this type of thinking and you know this type of doesn't matter how complex this relationship is and you know how much details you include in at the end we simply arrive at a single value static value of risk uh, for the particular for a particular region that we are talking about. This is the example that I showed you yesterday and it was really. We arrived at that by utilizing this kind of risk-based approach. There were a number of steps that we kind of analyzed here. <coughs> what you say is the final product, and that final product was generated by doing a climate analysis using the outputs of the climate analysis um, to uh, analyze the kind of hydrolog hydrologic conditions. And after the kind of hydrologic analysis, 
uh, we identify that the potential exposure due to the rivers that are going through the city of London, uh, uh, the kind of key impacts from the changing climate conditions, both temperature and precipitation, will be uh, flooding, and therefore the hydraulic analysis was the third step. to give us the kind of inundation. So these were the, 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 the physical kind of conditions and steps performed in this overall analysis. And then uh, uh, that helped us define basically the probability of hazard in the relationship that I previously mentioned. Then we used the uh, kind of exposure or went into risk analysis by combining this impact with the vulnerability or exposure. Uh, I mentioned that because this was a work done for the city, 12 types of infrastructure um, um, were considered. We were considering buildings, roads, bridges, railway, um, Water, uh, water network, electricity network, and that were both now kind of combined into something that resulted in this map that you actually see, where the map shows nothing else than basically spatial distribution of that uh, value or the number of, of, of kind of risk. So you, you, you see that the process was pretty exhaustive. Uh, the climate analysis required you know, a, a consideration of various climate models, downscaling procedures to come up with the precipitation and temperature. We needed a detailed hydrologic model to convert the precipitation into runoff. Uh, that was done for the kind of whole city. And then in the 169 locations, we were able to uh, have the runoff values and use them with the hydraulic analysis to um, estimate the, the inundation. And this is all done for various scenarios of the climate, uh, of the climate conditions. I mentioned that use of various models or use of various emission scenarios arrives or provides the various kind of conditions. So the whole analysis was uh, repeated for a number of different scenarios. Uh, vulnerability analysis was extremely detailed. Uh, we had uh, more than 14,000 elements within this map. Uh, that were considered to, you know, the level of detail that you observe the uh, inundation and the duration of the inundation, uh, duration of the inundation uh, uh, at, the, at these different locations in order to calculate the risk. So the calculation was done for all these different pieces of infrastructure for different climate scenarios and the number of these maps were then produced, created, and provided to the city decision makers. At the end, um, they were you know, very happy with that. They had the opportunity to see now in space, and what I was telling you, identify the main kind of contributors to the risk uh, uh, that was mapped. However, that was a, really the single response, the single value that corresponded to relatively complex, you know, input or the climate uh, climate scenario. So what what we have done, we actually generated a number of these maps in order to reflect the potential change in the initial conditions, uh, to potential change in different, you know, kind of climate outputs, climate estimates, and uh, basically repeated the whole process for various climates, uh, climate inputs. So instead of having just one map, we arrived with a very large number of maps. And as you can see here, um, each of the maps is being characterized by one particular climate change scenario and one particular uh, probability or a return period that we were uh, considering. The reason for that was that 
basically in case of flooding in this particular region, the main decision-making criterion is protection from the 100-year floods. And um, that is determining the kind of uh, uh, floodplains that shouldn't be populated, the, where the development shouldn't be allowed. And that was taken into, uh, into this calculation. Useful information and the possibility to identify what is contributing to risk uh, was also valued by the decision makers. I told you the idea of, for example, seeing that all the wastewater treatment plants are flooded. This was another interesting example. This is one of the main streets uh, uh, in, in the downtown area, and the rain for, uh, ra sorry, the train. The train uh, goes through the uh, through the city, so there is a culvert under the uh, railway, and this particular culvert doesn't have sufficient capacity for the potential uh, uh, flows uh, caused by changing climatic conditions, and the consequence was the potential inundation of the residential areas. So lots of buildings here. The city liable <laughs> for that almost immediately reacted to this picture and said, okay, we, uh, a railway is a federal responsibility in Canada and municipal responsibility is obviously related to the protection of the buildings and functioning of the streets and so on. So they immediately used this as an argument to talk to federal government and find a way how this potential problem can be, can be resolved. So you see, the useful practical information can be generated through this type of risk maps. However, there is a number of issues that are uh, um, of importance in this kind of process or the limitations. Um, I think the key limitation is that we have a s just or we generate through this process a single value, static value in time and space. So, you know, you get the map, but this map is not changing, <laughs> only the colors are changing on the map. Um, there are major difficulties in uh, the number of these steps that I mentioned, like um, difficulties in assessing the probability of extreme events. Um, um, in this case, we were going through the climate models, different climate models would produce different precipitation, uh, different uh, 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 statistical tools can be used to come up the with the probability of the 100 year or 250 year return period flood. And, you know, which probability to use, what data to use, is always kind of uh, creating some difficulties in the process. And at the end, uh, kind of combining this now physical information with the socioeconomic and socioeconomic data is not always very easy. Um, kind of how to integrate the physical, the social impact, economic impact, health impact, with ecological consequences into the single, uh, into the single relationship is, is not straightforward. So that's the reason, at least these are the arguments that I'm using to justify the move to, to justify the move to another forum or another kind of framework that will respond to some of these limitations. Uh, in this move, I'm seeing resilience actually giving us opportunity to look at the problem in a dynamic way so that we include the change in time and space. And also it allows us to consider any type, any type of uh, uh, losses, physical, social, health, you know, completely. So any potential impacts that this disaster may have can be incorporated through this uh, concept very, in a very straightforward way. And I try to illustrate and show you how that can be done. So, so the idea of the resilience is to respond to the limitations of the risk management and also expand the context so that we can move uh, towards or treat that as a development paradigm or used in the future, in the future development. So, so the, what, what we are doing, I did show you this graph yesterday, we are replacing the single value of that R at the particular location uh, with the whole function with a whole function that captures the system response to potential change in, or disturbance, in this case, flood. 
Yeah? If you relate to the case that I did show you earlier, uh, this graph will be now representing various impacts that uh, we were considering here in this process for the city. For the city. We had the 12 different infrastructures, so one way of, or one graph could be applied for one infrastructure, number of buildings being inundated. Okay, so you can capture what is happening, you can observe uh, with the change in time with the inundation, how the number of buildings is going to go down and up. Another could be the roads. Um, so the, the, the kilometers of roads being, of, you know, or changed with the change of the flooding conditions and inundation. The third type of impact or performance could be some kind of health indicator. Let's say the number of hospital beds available for uh, those that may need help or be injured during the, during the disaster. So you see, we can create multiple graphs. We can use the different units of the system performance. And you don't have any particular limitation because each of them will be generated in the independently. So the, the, the idea is that now we can look at different aspects of the system uh, performance. Uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can observe and document the change in the performance over time. And obviously, this process is quite demanding. <laughs> in order to arrive at this curve, you need to kind of have the input information about the disturbance. You have to have a kind of dynamic observation of the changing condition. For example, in the case of flood, um, how will the inundation change over time? Yeah? So you need a full kind of flood hydrograph. And you need that in every possible location uh, of, of interest within the, within the region. So the conceptually, it's relatively easy that you see this switch you know, from static to dynamic and uh, uh, with the ability to incorporate various types of impact. But uh, again, when you look at the kind of analytical requirements, you need a lot of kind of work to come up with the graphs like this. And this is where the system's representation of your, uh, of your kind of problem domain uh, could be essential to help you simulate uh, the impacts and come up with this uh, type of graphs. Now, <coughs> these graphs are being characterized by number of uh, uh, important, they call them four R's, or number of important pieces of information. One is the slope of this part of the graph. This slope is basically documenting how fast you're losing the performance. How fast, for example, the roads will be inundated. Um, how fast different, let's say, the, the hospital beds will be filling in with the people affected by the disaster. So the, the, the second R is, and this, this R is called the redundancy of the system. You know, how capable is the system to uh, uh, respond to these changing conditions and how fast is responding will determine basically the slope of this, of this part of the graph. The second one is uh, robustness. Robustness is defined as the minimum level of performance that remains in the system after disturbance. So, you know, not all the roads within the city will be inundated. Only the roads which are in the inundated part, the remaining roads can still be functional. So that are, uh, determines that kind of minimum, minimum level level of performance. Then the third R is resourcefulness, or basically the slope of the recovery curve, or recovery part of the curve. Uh, the reason why it's called resourcefulness, because we, this slope can be changed by the mobilization of resources. 
if you decide to put a lot of people, equipment, money into the recovery, you can very fast bring the system back to the, perform uh, to the initial performance. If you don't do that, if you delay your decisions, this slope can be very low and the system can take a very long time, very long time to recover. And the final uh, R, or the fourth R, is the time between the beginning of the disturbance and the final stage when the system fully recovers from the disturbance. Now, uh, this time is obviously playing essential role if you are providing, you know, kind of health <laughs> assistance or if you are uh, um, if you are connecting particular locations within the community. And so we, you had a picture of that. Uh, highway in Toronto being totally cut and this highway was out of operation for approximately six, eight months. Um, and I can tell you this is one of the three highways that goes south, north direction. And it was a havoc for the city, you know, during that period of time because of the load uh, that was now, you know, normally shared between three major highways was transferred onto two of them. And Toronto is a city of over 10 million people. You can imagine, you know, the uh, uh, peak, peak uh, uh, load of transport that that was. So, you know, the timing and the time required for the uh, uh, recovery is very important characteristic. Now, what is good about these four things? It is actually giving us opportunity to analyze how we can adapt and where we can intervene in responding to the changing conditions. Uh, you can respond in advance. You can say flooding will be happening in this particular region because we have these rivers, they were flooding in the past, and you can decide actually to put some resources in place even before the disaster. That will be kind of proactive measure. This proactive adaptation measure will definitely affect this, this slope and it will make it, you know, uh, smaller. It will probably ri rise the robustness level and so on. Or you can actually look at, okay, it's uh, because I'm talking about, let's say, electricity electricity supply system, you know, part of Canada is hit yesterday, the remainings of the Dorian, and the whole East Coast is for two days already without electricity. So uh, it is essential for many functions of the society that you have this robustness at a much higher level. So how that can be secured by, you know, some intervention, some adaptation measures, that can be implemented to rise or rise this from the black to, let's say, blue line. Or in the recovery process, especially if the people are affected, like Bahamas, where there is no food, water, electricity, anything, you know, what can we do? What kind of resources we can put to help and possibly recover, change the slope to, from black to red to blue? You dropped the Again? I don't know, this is coming down. Okay, I see. <coughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Professor, I have a question. Okay. In this graph, you have uh, two different places or two different events, the event A and the event B, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, from the perspective of resilience, which one you could say is more resilient? We'll come to that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted first to kind of familiarize you with this kind of whole idea of the performance uh, and the system performance, system performance here. And these four R's, which are really now important characteristics of the performance curve, and my, uh, my kind of approach to quantifying resiliency is relying on this performance curve. So I'll come to that and you will see actually the answer relatively easily. Uh, I just wanted to make one more point that in this particular graph I am you know, relatively freely uh, showing that the system uh, will come back to uh, initial performance level. 
you have to realize that this is not always the case. <laughs> that we may not be from some disturbances, we may not be able to come back to the you know, initial performance. Or in some different conditions, with the appropriate use of the resources, we may actually push the system to higher level of performance than you know, at the beginning by strengthening and hardening the system to actually respond to future disturbances in a more efficient way. So, and everything can be very nicely done by observing the difference between the redundancy, robustness, resourcefulness, and the rapidity as the, as the descriptors of this performance, performance curve. Now, the appropriate question. <laughs> okay, where is the resilience here? So, I just would like now to summarize that if we approach the problem using the performance, curves in a dynamic form, uh, uh, we will be able to utilize that to uh, and quantify the value of resilience. So, so this will be kind of positive approach in my opinion because it gives you these four different characteristics. Uh, you can immediately see the change and also gives you opportunity to kind of analyze uh, various, potential, various potential response actions. Uh, uh, the ability to kind of uh, play with this performance curve and push maybe the performance to higher level than initial um, gives you opportunity to deal with the potential future uh, uh, impacts. So before I explain how is this being used, let me kind of walk you through the, uh, through the definitions of resilience that are existing today in the literature. Uh, the initial, uh, by the way, the term resilience is very old. Uh, and those of you, you know, in engineering, maybe you remember uh, the, the, the resilience of materials in the theory of materials we were using. That. So resilio is the Latin word that existed, you know, for centuries. However, the kind of main effort and kind of uh, rebirth of resilience as we are considering today came from the ecology and from the Professor Buzz Hollings' work uh, in ecological systems. He passed away relatively recently, a couple of months back, where the, the, the resilience uh, was defined as ability of system to withstand the stress of environmental loading and recover from that. So his focus was on ecological systems and disturbances that are uh, happening in the ecological systems and their ability uh, to recover. And then the term entered into the hazard-based literature and multiple definitions were uh, made available. Capacity to respond to extreme events, capacity of the community society potentially exposed to hazard to adapt, by resisting the change in order to reach and maintain acceptable level of functioning. Uh, so kind of more focusing with this definition on the robustness as a, as a kind of minimum level of performance. The capacity to absorb shocks while maintaining some level of functioning. Capacity to adapt to, exist, uh, to adapt existing resources and skills to changing situations, new situation and operating conditions. There were even uh, definitions in psychology, in medicine. Um, I found a couple of them, the kind of creation of meaning in life, even life that is sometimes painful and absurd, and having the courage to live fully despite its inherent pain and <laughs> futility. So see how the psychologists are converting these definitions into their domain. And this one, you don't quote me, I took it from the, uh, from the literature. Uh, where somebody was defining resilience as making chicken salad out of the chicken shit. So uh, the, the, the idea from basically bad conditions creating something good was uh, common in all these different definitions. We should erase this from the slide that I'm going to remain. Um, the definition that kind of was based on, on all these different sources and that I used in quantifying the, the resilience for our purpose is a little bit longer, but published in the 2013 paper and I think accepted for the domain of the infrastructure, water infrastructure. And um, I am going into this ability of system 
uh, its com and its component parts to anticipate, absorb, accommodate, or recover from the effects of the disruption in a timely and efficient manner, including through um, ensuring the preservation, restoration, and improvement of essential basic structures and functions. Lots of words, uh, but basic idea is uh, that the resilience captures the disturbance to the system, uh, the, the consequences of this, the uh, consequences of the disturbance and response of the system uh, in the kind of efficient manner. And the kind of two key words are, in my opinion, the preservation of the structure of the system and functioning of the system. So the you know, disturbance can be happening to system uh, let's say system infrastructure by fully uh, uh, destroying the structure. So like fully washing out the road where you need to, like a case in Toronto. Or uh, it can be only inundating the road for uh, two, three days or two, three hours and then, you know, after that coming back. So this definition is kind of capturing what I think we would like to, we would like resilience to be. And now here is the answer to Felipe's question. Where is the link between the performance and um, how we use the system performance in coming up uh, with the resilience? So if th this is the representation from the graph that we were analyzing in details previously, uh, various system performance uh, uh, <coughs> indices can be used to create these response curves. And if this initial level of performance is uh, undisturbed performance, then what is this area uh, above the black curve and between the initial performance will be measure of lost or performance, you know, how much of that performance is lost over the period of time. So then I was reasoning <laughs> if this is the loss of performance, then the remaining performance will be still the ability of the system to kind of continue functioning and everything else. And um, our ability to kind of find out that value may be uh, useful and characterize. And basically, this is what I named, uh, uh, named the quantitative resilience, the area under the performance curve that can be obtained by integrating this area up to each moment in time and converting then this performance curve into resilience curve, where the points on this curve are basically the areas under the remaining performance. And that's the, that's the whole idea of the, of the quantification. Now, there's a lot of useful things in that process. First is that you realize that each performance uh, um, will be in its own units. Um, roads inundated in kilometers, uh, hospital beds in number of beds, uh, people affected in number of people, buildings affected in number of buildings, economic damage in reals or dollars. So kind of putting together <laughs> dollars and kilometers is not easy, but when we integrate this area, uh, we can normalize through the total area and basically represent now the performance, or sorry, the resilience as the value between zero and one. So you will have for each characteristic of system performance the kind of same scale between zero and one, and you can now combine them easily. So you can add them together, you can use other uh, uh, ways of combining, like a multiplication and so on, and basically arrive at the total value or the total resilience of the system. You can have the resilience curve for each impact for each performance, or you can uh, put them together and come up with the total one. That's the whole idea behind the, behind the quantification process. 
what is important is to realize that the shape of this curve is the function of the, obviously, system performance, but it's also the function of the adaptive capacity, how, resist, you know, how, how much the system can resist the change. And that is captured by the shape, uh, by the shape of the curve. This is a little bit of math behind what I was telling you about. Uh, the, the basically integral, the resilience being the integral value or the area between the initial system performance and the black line, the performance level at a particular point in time. And then the normalization process that helps us basically convert now the each value on the scale to zero to one. And in this particular case, um, I propose the very specific way of integrating uh, the, the elements of the resilience. So small r represents the resilience of roads, uh, r2 will be resilience of hospitals and three buildings and so on. And what I propose here is the multiplication as the matrix of combining them with this particular, uh, with this particular value and the shape of this mathematical relationship is actually giving you ability to properly combine the values that may be very different on a scale, like uh, a damage could be in millions of dollars and the uh, uh, number of kilometers of road lost could be in few meters or uh, one kilometer. So in order to do that, uh, kind of this shape of mathematical relationship is very good to put things together. But there is no limitation, you can combine them in any way, really in any way you want. And what I was saying at the end, um, if <coughs> you are trying to kind of show uh, the overall change in resilience, uh, uh, you are the, basically what this is describing is that shape of the curve where this part is documenting the adaptive capacity and this part is documenting the response or the or the impact. So this can be done analytically or calculated analytically if you have the equation for the shape curve, or it can be modeled using some of the, uh, some of the system, uh, system tools. And that's what we kind of have done. Um, there is a, there is a, my laboratory is publishing the documents, uh, technical documents called blue books. You can find them all on the website. And uh, we have a one that provides even the code for calculating this resilience or quantifying resilience where this type of system graph is converted into small computer code uh, where the uh, kind of impacts on one side and adaptive capacity are linked to the resilience through the adaptation and vulnerability indicating that as a system you have uh, a set of feedbacks that are kind of driving that process and interactions between the, uh, between the <coughs> performance and uh, uh, adaptation. We also expanded this. So this calculation is done for each location in space. So what we have done, we linked this to spatial tools, the GIS type of system, where the calculation of resilience in one point in space is basically the curve that I'm showing. And then when you connect them for all different points in space, you actually get the map that captures the spatial distribution of resilience. And that's, that's about the quantification. This is the idea that uh, uh, we kind of implemented in few fields already, flooding, uh, hydropower safety, um, the, uh, municipal infrastructure uh, design and management, and I'm going to kind of go over two, three days remaining through these examples, so you will see how that can be done. This is the good moment for me to make a break. Um, if this is okay with you, uh, we can now have the break, and then I'll continue with, the, uh, with basically the implementation or expansion of this quantification concept to networked systems, which require a little bit different math. First, do you guys have any questions? <coughs> Did I go too fast through this, or it's okay? You captured the idea? Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, 
next question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <coughs> it's not really a question, but it's more like I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Like the resilience, it's, it varies on the time. Yes. So, I don't Yes, but for example, if I want to know how resilient is my infrastructure there, so I, I don't have a, an actual value. I have just like this curve. You I have the graph, uh, yeah. The graph, okay. Yeah. But that graph, <coughs> that graph uh, uh, provides you with the necessary information, but it's a, dynam it's a dynamic information. It's telling you that you know, resilience of this particular piece of infrastructure is changing with time and with the, so the whole move from risk to resilience is the move from static to dynamic representation. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, you may now look at into use of this graph in various ways. Someone may say, okay, I would like to know what is my minimum level of resilience or I would like to know, you know, how long will take the system. So you, you, you can take any element from the graph for your kind of decision making. But my, my suggestion is that the value is in the graph. Mm -hmm. The value is in the graph as a replacement for the single value. Okay, and if I want to predict this for the future, I do some models about the system performance yeah. or no? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes, so the whole idea is now we are switching from the multiplying the probability of the hazard with consequences mm -hmm. to simulation of the whole performance of the system over the period of time. So whatever disturbance you would like, let's say, to understand for, or you would like to analyze for the future will require kind of identifying this impact and then repeating the simulation of the model, finding the consequences, the system performance component, performing this calculation and creating this graph. And my goal is to decrease this difference between the one yeah. to the top yeah. bottom what of what the curve. Time, what I'm suggesting how this to be used, uh, you're going to see actually be implemented that in a number of tools is that you do the calculation of the resilience with and without the particular adaptation measure. Ah, okay. So let's say uh, we are interested in the flood protection of the region, we can consider doing nothing, um, you will have the certain level of resilience. Or we can put the levy of particular height, you repeat the simulation, you find out that the resilience will go up. Okay. Uh, then you can do another measure, you know, inundation, some, sorry, the, 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 some derivation of the water somewhere no, uh, upstream, you get the third one. And now you can use that, you can use it combined with other criteria, but the resilience becomes one criteria that can help you decision make. You can then compare with the cost of measures and so on. But it's always the whole capturing the whole process. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> this graph is, f is for a specific e event. If you, for example, uh, send 100 return mm -hmm. period, mm -hmm. if you vary the, the event, we need to change the, the graph to yes. the response. To yes, you are right. So, so this, this particular graph is the response to particular changing conditions. So, and, and yes, it is, so this is why I am saying, instead of finding the probability of hazard as a single value, here you are simulating the system performance for various, various conditions. And that's where the kind of additional load is in the analysis, but I think the outcome or the output is much more informative for the decision-making process. But when we need to plan in an infrastructure, uh, we need to have an a event. Yeah. Like, uh, I need to design uh, then, and you, uh, we, we need to fix the return period for, yeah. for know the, this, this graph. Uh, this is where I kind of disagree. <laughs> Uh, I, I think we do not have ability anymore to fix that. The 100-year the flood 
is becoming totally, I don't know what's the kind of year of flood, yeah. you know, based on the historical information, based on the potentially future outcomes of the various climate models and so on. And this is the reason. So instead of having a single value, you, you actually perform this kind of simulation performances for various conditions of yeah. change. And that's what yesterday, if you remember, I was ending the presentation with the performance-based engineering. Performance-based yeah. engineering is nothing else than actually performing this simulation multiple times instead of saying, oh no, we are going to design the spillway for you know, uh, maximum probable flood. That maximum probable flood today is totally different from one <laughs> yesterday <laughs> or the one that you may uh, estimate in the future. That's the difference. Thank you. So you recommend that we don't use design storms anymore, but yes. simulations over yes. the time with yes. the continuous yes. uh, response of the global? Yeah. yeah. Ah, OK. That's the whole idea. That's the whole. It's not easy switch, <laughs> okay. but that's the whole idea. Okay. And, 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 you know, if you're designing, let's say, a spillway, or if you're designing, you know, a particular piece of infrastructure through this multiple simulations, once when you have the model of the system performing the simulations, multiple simulations nowadays is nothing. I mean, you can do it on the laptops, you know, in minutes. And, and kind of performing multiple simulations give you a pretty good understanding, <laughs> you know, how is the performance changing for particular changing conditions. And, 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 and also having the whole curve gives you opportunity to decide where and how to intervene, how to adapt. So it's not, okay, we know flooding will be prevented if I put some barrier. No, but is this barrier better than diverting water into storage? Is this barrier better if it goes up to this level or this level? So, so you have ability to very easily change the design characteristics, repeat the simulation, and compare you know, how that affects the resilience. And on the basis of this idea, we actually built the tool for the city of Toronto. I'm going to demonstrate it, I think, after tomorrow. Uh, so you will see how that basically works in a particular environment, in a particular. But it's not fully accepted by <laughs> the community. These are still pretty innovative ideas. And um, I think this is the reason why I like talking to younger people, because you may see the benefit and try to actually bring that into practice. Any other questions? You OK? OK, so let's have a break, and then we'll continue. Just a few reminds. Uh, I'm going to say this in Portuguese because it's important also for the other institutions. É, o pessoal que tem interesse em registrar os créditos, o limite agora é de manhã, aqui na, pela Universidade de São Paulo, pela Universidade de Campina Grande e de, de Pernambuco. É, vocês devem procurar a pós-graduação de vocês para efetuar a matrícula nesses créditos. And uh, in the afternoon, we will have some workshop, some discussions with professionals from other institutions. We will have uh, experts from the National Agents of Water in Brazil. We will have uh, professionals from the CEMADEN. Yes, uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to translate you wrong, but it's the National Agency Early Warning. How do you say? Early Warning and Monitoring Disasters. Yes, and we will also have uh, local authorities from uh, São Carlos Municipality. So please hear and, and in the afternoon, it's going to be a very nice discussion. Okay, so let's have 30 minutes break. Okay. <laughs> 